The first mastering engineers were people in charge of cutting a flat transfer of the sound recording from real tape to a disc and thus it was the advent of tape recording technology what allowed for the first time these audio technicians or quote unquote mastering engineers to modify, edit and sequence the content of any recording prior to cutting to disc. This disc would then be used as the master for mass replication, hence the word mastering. In those days, it was a mundane function that any beginning audio engineer technician could perform inside a four-wall room. The main part of this function, but not the only one, was to check upon the sound quality during transfers. As the years went by and progress in audio technology was made, mastering engineers started to use two key sound reinforcement pieces of gear, the audio compressor and the equalizer. The recordings could now be tonally changed and rebalanced to optimize the transfers to discs. By the 1950s, this skill of optimizing the disc's physical constraints gave mastering engineers a newfound importance and they were, from then on, considered to be in a league of their own. Technology has advanced to a point that is conceivable to create records very inexpensively. Most musicians today, especially those in the indie circuit, are recording and mixing their own music like never before. But unfortunately, technology alone doesn't necessarily guarantee the making of great records. The process of mastering to achieve good speaker translation for all existing playback systems can be a daunting task and a real challenge to any so-called mastering engineer or quote-unquote M.E. But seasoned M.E.s listening inside acoustically fine-tuned mastering rooms will adjust recordings day in and day out and compile them with similar frequency balance and perceived loudness to a final storage medium, e.g. wave computer file, CD, tape reel, etc. for proper playback system translation. As one can see in the illustration, there are many targets to hit and the resulting master source will have to translate and sound on point on those speaker systems to be considered a well done mastering job. However, these sonic results are always best when processing from great sounding mixes. That is, great mixing is the key to a great master. Having said all that, and since the subject at hand is mastering, we will not discuss recording or mixing techniques and will concentrate all our attention to the subject of mastering alone. But it has to be said that mastering is often a very misunderstood and utterly underestimated process while mastering engineers are highly overrated. To understand all of this, one needs to put things in a realistic perspective first. So what is mastering? The short answer, mastering is the last step in the recording process executed by an experienced and specialized sound technician who checks the quality of the audio or music for best system translation preparing the audio content for both mass replication and broadcasting. This preparation may consist of track sequencing, the order of the tracks, track PQ coding or pre-gapping, the spaces between the tracks, and or other types of code programming, e.g. ISRC, UPC bar, and text for CD. Some mild signal processing may be required in order to create a cohesive audio material, but sometimes this becomes the main expectation or focal point of the engineer. Long answer. From a historical point of view, the name to this process was originally pre-mastering, while mastering 
used to be referred to the actual creation at the manufacturing plant of the replication medium, the master itself. But these days, pre-mastering is synonymous of mastering, which from a technical point of view is also the process of optimizing all individual frequency levels to meet industry standards. The mastering process is, for the most part, source-dependent. So, the better you mix, the better the results to be obtained. Because of this, results vary from recording to recording, making mastering a crucial step prior to manufacturing and broadcasting for best system translation. One way to look at this process is the way one looks at publishing on the web. While it has given everybody the freedom to create web pages on just about any subject, there is usually no proper editorial content. So a mastering engineer acts sort of like an editor, making sure that anything written is spelled out right and displayed or presented to a worldwide audience correctly. A mastering engineer, or ME, should be able to make a great mix sound louder, punchier, and clearer, better than any other type of audio engineer, without making, in the process, a significant sonic sacrifice. Next to experience, a mastering engineer has all the tools needed, e.g. the gear and the acoustic environment. But one is certainly not the deciding factor to achieve great recordings. However, since most music production mixes don't come out in terms of tonal balance perfect all of the time, mastering is also a necessary step to improve upon system translation by means of harmonic balancing. Many engineers regard their mastering process as a way of adding impact, color, and vibe to the audio material they work on in a proprietary manner which is fine as long as they don't introduce too much circuitry noise and harmonic distortion into their signal chain. The job may also include disk assembly and quality control for manufacturing purposes when and if required by their clients. What is a mastering engineer required to have in order to provide this service? Mastering should preferably be conducted inside an acoustically fine-tuned neutral response room or one that can control sound reflections and it's equipped with a flat response speaker monitoring system. In addition, if an inexperienced engineer is performing this task without the foregoing, and the guidance of a spectrum analysis, chances are that a harmonically imbalanced master recording will be sent to the manufacturing plant for mass replication, and that could have in the long run serious consequences. Realistic Mastering Results Number one, bad mixes always yield bad mastering results, no exceptions. Number two, mediocre mixes yield inconsistent mastering results. However, some significant improvements are usually achieved when done right, and some results may even meet industry standards. Number three, good mixes are always elevated to industry standards, and sometimes the results are dramatic. Number four, great mixes meet by default industry standards, but with the exception that there is usually little room for improving upon system translation and the ideal RMS level which has to be finalized. In most cases, other than increasing loudness, the results may only be perceived as settled. This video is being brought to you by the Directory of Mastering Studios, DMS listing all the reputable and legitimate mastering studios around the world since 2016.
If you're looking for real mastering engineers, join this site absolutely free to find the studio you need according to your budget. Grading mix quality results. You may ask an ME to critique or grade your mix, but this isn't really something that should be expected free of charge. Many engineers consider this nothing but a consultation, and because it does engage their full attention and takes time, it requires a paying fee. Your miles may vary, but grading a mix from the usual A as the best mix and E the worst you can expect a good mastering engineer to raise the quality level to about half grade, for example, from a C mediocre quality to a C plus. Or we can also grade with a five star system, from an A grade mix, five stars, to the lowest E grade mix, one star. That being said, five star mixes are extremely rare and require an audio engineer with many years of experience in mixing, about 10 years being the usual. This also means that the mastering engineer, other than to boost and match levels, very little or nothing would do to the mix. Does that sound to you like cheating? It's not. Mastering is not always about what you do to a mix, but what you don't. Because even for one to arrive to the conclusion that the mix is perfect, and that it will translate fine on all playback systems, requires many years of mastering experience, very good monitoring environment, or both. In addition, a highly experienced and skilled mastering engineer using quality tools to process audio could possibly raise the quality by one whole grade, that is, from B or good quality to A or excellent quality. This is why it's so important to choose a reputable mastering engineer. If you don't, this mix that you've spent lots of money on and a long time to get it sounding right, it's actually going to be degraded in sound quality at this particular last step because of the incompetency or the inexperience of a mastering engineer. Make sure you are at the very least working with a mastering engineer registered on the directory of mastering studios to minimize the risk of being provided with bad results or worse, getting ripped off. That being said, bad mixes can potentially sound a bit better by a skilled engineer, although never as good as well-mixed records. There is certainly no chance at all that it will sound like a mix produced at a state-of-the-art facility. If you're not sure you have a good mix, Seek professional advice. A reputable mastering engineer could tell you what you really have if you ask politely and are patient enough with his busy schedule. Some give you this advice as part of the mastering fees, others, as I said, charge as a separate service upfront. A mastering engineer who wants you as a client might tell you exactly what is wrong and what needs adjustment, even for free. But don't expect one to volunteer an opinion. You need to ask first. One may also not even charge you for this expert opinion because after you make new revisions, you will probably be more inclined to hire one for one's experience, great suggestions and professional advice. Again, don't expect this to be part of the service. The most successful mastering engineers have very good reasons not to form opinions on anybody's mixing work, and they just process whatever is given, no questions asked. Some fear that they may offend the sensibilities of the mixing engineer, especially if the client was behind the mixing. Therefore, due to the nature of the business, this could present to some MEs a big conflict of interest they won't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. I certainly will not discuss a mix that came from a record company, but I might do it if I'm asked by a newbie mixing engineer. Now, if you want to attempt doing this mastering work all by yourself, let's talk about the three main conditions for DIY mastering. You will need to have at the very minimum the following. One, a digital audio workstation, DAW, with mastering software installed. 
2. A pair of very accurate speaker monitors as close to flat response as possible. And 3. An acoustically conditioned room as accurate as one can get it to be. If you don't have conditions 2 and 3, do it at your own risk. Subscribe free of charge, click on the bell icon to receive a notification, give us a like and share this video with anyone you know interested in audio recording technology. A digital workstation. I don't want to get focused on this requirement too much. Many of you know about workstations and computers more than I, and thus I'll keep it simple. The DAW is basically a computer system with an audio card to capture and to output sound. Better results can be achieved by adding high-quality AD-DA signal converters, though this benefit comes at a higher price tag. There are some converters that are a lot more expensive than both the computer and mastering software put together. But still, there are units that accomplish the job under $1,000. If you can't afford good converters, you can attempt mastering in the box or ITB with decent results. As long as you stay in the digital domain, you will be fine. Fairly accurate speaker monitors. If mastering depends on what you hear, then you can't skip on these crucial items. If you thought about mixing and mastering yourself, then you need a pair of monitors that reveal the true frequency response of the recorded sound. I doubt you're going to find quality speakers that can respond relatively flat at less than $500 a piece. Thus, those $300 speakers that you use for mixing will only make the mastering task a whole lot more difficult to accomplish due to the fact that you are not going to correct frequencies that you cannot hear. Warning, if you do both mixing and mastering, even with mastering speakers, you may still miss or not be able to clearly hear rogue frequency peaks and or flaws created at the mixing stage due to calm filtering issues in the room. However, nothing is impossible when you have good ears or instinct for recorded sound accompanied by great knowledge of the use of an accurate real-time spectrum analyzer. Acoustically conditioned room. The room you use to monitor in is essentially the place where you do your critical listening and make all your compression and equalization decisions. Most people know that the room you record in should not be used to mix and master as well. Thus, having one room to record and one to monitor is the ideal situation. But having an extra room is a luxury that many don't have. To make things more difficult, if the room is also flawed with calm filtering issues or acoustical interferences, then the speakers you use for monitoring sound might be rendered from either not so accurate to almost useless. Because sound always bounces on reflective boundaries, the shape of a room and even the contents in it can be a big factor on how sound will be perceived. Even your distance and angle from monitors can change that perception. You can improve upon room acoustics with sound traps, sound deflectors and acoustic treatment or by hiring an acoustics engineer to redesign an existing room or build a new one if necessary. If you choose the latter, you'll be required to invest some serious dollars in it. To recap, there can't be great mastering without great mixes to begin with. A good or decent mix can be mastered and the sound quality raised to industry standard, but this can never be accomplished with a poorly engineered record. It's never gonna happen. If your mix is bad, then expect disappointing results. Sound process point of view only. Bad mixes yield bad mastering results. No exceptions. Don't waste your time. 
mediocre mixes yield inconsistent mastering results, but some significant improvements are usually achieved when done right and some results may even meet industry standards, or whatever they call it these days. Here is where the experience of the ME might save the day. Good mixes are always elevated to industry standards, and sometimes results are perceived as dramatic. Great mixes meet by default industry standards, and there is usually little room for improvement. Other than increasing loudness, the results may only be perceived as subtle. Conclusion Unless you never second-guess your own mixes, consistently produce outstanding mixing results time after time, build a frequency response accurate mastering room to do all this mixing and mastering work or mixturing in the same place or location, have a budget set aside to buy all the basic gear needed, and have plenty of time on your hands to practice the art of mastering, it's simply a lot faster and cheaper to hire a professional mastering engineer within your album's budget today than learning tomorrow something that's going to take a long time to sink in. If you like the content and visual quality of this video, please give us a like and share it with friends interested in this particular subject.